Hi, my name is Gerard Dache. I'm the executive director of the Government Blockchain Association. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, blockchain and voting. Uh, so we've got a couple of distinguished guests. I'm going to let them uh, in introduce themselves. I'm going to start off with um, uh, with uh, uh, Philip. So Philip, why don't you uh, introduce yourself, and then we'll have uh, Susan and then Jeremy uh, introduce themselves, and then I'll, I'll ask you. Uh, and uh, then I'll ask you guys to do some opening statements. We do have a, a other members of the voting working group, Adam Ernest, and and a bunch of other, and Eugene. I'll, I'll also ask you to introduce yourself. Um, so I we'll we'll be hearing from everybody and then we'll have open discussions uh of course there are thank you all right so uh philip by all means we'll have, why don't you introduce yourself and then uh susan jeremy and eugene and then we'll do opening statements after that so good morning and good day to all of you i am philip andre i'm an advisor to a company called votes v-o-a-t-z we are the first provider of a mobile app based voting solution built on a mobile phone platform. Uh, we joined the GBA some time ago, uh, given that blockchain forms a core component of our architecture, and then joined with Susan in the voting working group to look at the definition of standards. Um, I heard people ask about identity, so I'll give a kind of a two minute, what do we do uh, as part of the registration of the device and the identity of the individual, we scan a government document. And if the government document was to be electronic, we would obviously communicate with that government document. We establish that person's eligibility based on a dialogue with the registration the, the registrar or the jurisdiction or the election authority, depending on what name they want to use. We present the user with a ballot. We allow them to mark the ballot. We anonymously sign the ballot digitally with signatures on uh, hashes and all those good cryptographic processes. And we return the ballot anonymously to a blockchain for recording, to a lockbox for printing, and to a bulletin board to allow the consumer to confer, and I should not say consumer, I should say voter to confirm their intent. Um, the tabulation is external to our environment. We assume a paper record is to, be report, is to be created, and that paper record would then be used for audit and tabulation purposes. All right. All right, Susan, you wanna introduce yourself? I'm Susan Eustace. I invented the first electronic voting machine. And uh, there are lots of pictures of me if you're interested. The, uh, <laughs> and uh, one of the things I've done is run many, you know, thousands of elections of all different types, municipal, union, uh, and probably the most challenging are the government uh, elections for the poverty program. And I, I write, I'm, I write extensively about how to run an election. I write instruction manuals for all different types of equipment and for uh, users and for election workers. So I know, know a great deal about the elections process. Excellent, excellent. Uh, uh, Jeremy, you want to uh, introduce yourself and, and then Eugene after that? Hi, I'm Jeremy Epstein. Uh, my day job is at the US National Science Foundation where I lead the uh, biggest um, cybersecurity research program, at least the biggest unclassified cybersecurity research program in the world. Um, we have about 800 to 900 uh, active research projects, some of which involve blockchain. Um, and I've been uh, interested in the space of voting and security for about 15 years now, a poll worker uh, in my spare time. And I'm uh, well known for my um, uh, extreme uh, skepticism uh, regarding uh, the use of blockchain for voting. I, I think there's uh, many useful places uh, for blockchain, including in elections other than voting, but not in voting. And I should uh, wrap it up by saying that my opinions are my opinions and do not necessarily represent those of the United States government. Thank you. Thank you. Eugene? 
Yes, Gerard, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak and greetings, everyone. My name is Eugene Morozov. I work with um, a decentralized, self-governed, distributed online community called Free Ton. And I also do a lot of things as part of uh, a government blockchain association activities. We are members of a number of groups including this one. And I just want to praise Gerard for doing something incredibly important, which is putting people of different opinions at the table together so that they can sit down and in a civilized manner, iron out their differences and find the best solutions. I think it's a wonderful thing, Gerard. And I thank you for that. Also a very brief uh, announcement. And that is uh, a few days ago, Gerard gave an extensive interview to a journalist called, called Ben Sunderland for a publication called Hacker Noon. It's a great interview. Gerard, I'm sure you have a copy by now. I would not hesitate to share it because you do talk about incredible things there. Very important. That's my brief intro. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I think Ben is an incredible writer because he he made even my interview sound uh, interesting and important. So that was uh, pretty good. And, and thank you, Eugene, for your kind words. Uh, I, I'm not promising that this will be civil, but hopefully it will at least be informative. <laughs> hopefully it will be civil. John, uh, would you like to introduce yourself? And then after you're done, I'm going to ask everybody to make an opening statement. Sure. Uh, my name's John Sebas. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Open Source Election Technology Institute. As you might guess from the name of the Institute, we make election technology and we make it open source because we believe all election technology should be transparent and people should not be worrying about uh, whether something called Dominion stole elections by sending votes to Germany where they were changed and other silly things. Um, most uh, relevantly, I think to this group, one of the things that we're, we've been working on for the last year uh, and that I will speak briefly about uh, is our initiative in um, home voting, uh, particularly for voters uh, with disabilities who are really underserved uh, by their current options. So I'll speak a bit about that. Um, we're not working on blockchain voting uh, per se. That would be kind of uh, a fifth step after the four steps that we're taking. Uh, but I will also uh, make some remarks on some other blockchain related technologies that we are developing in elections uh, as well. So that'll That's do for starting. I hope, awesome. Gerard, and I, and, back to you. Yeah, and listen, I, I wanna just let everybody know how honored I am and how honored we should all be because uh, all the folks on this panel uh, have really dedicated a, a, a huge portion of their life to some stuff that's really important. So um, I want to thank all of you guys for being here. Philip, let's start with you. Uh, why don't you go ahead and make an opening statement? Uh, and then Susan, uh, what, uh, after, after Philip, then you can make your opening statement. Okay. Um, for those of you who were at our last conversation, we began what from Votes' perspective is a civil dialogue between those who do not believe it is possible to use technology to support the marking and return of a uh, ballot in a secret private election, and those of us who believe that it is technically possible and that with the appropriate security evaluations and reviews by the appropriate level set of experts in under the right conditions, such a solution can be built. Earlier, I described a little bit about how our technology works. I'll expand a little bit in terms of what we do with the blockchain. We basically write an immutable record of the ballot as marked by the anonymous and previously verified voter. Uh, and for us, that creates the ability to, during the audit process, confirm that the immutable record matches the paper record, matches the, the, the intent of the, the, the voter with the ability for the voter to go participate in the audit process. Um, not much more to say, except I do hope, and from our perspective, unless it is a civil dialogue, um, we're not interested in getting into a 
an anger debate or a bullying conversation, we are interested in participating in a civil dialogue that looks to helping the world assure everybody, both those that are disabled and overseas, as well of those as well as those of us who do not want to stand in line or go to the post office, participate in the most important part of our election and our government, which is the election of our representatives. Excellent. And if we can keep it civil, then the next topic uh, that we'll do next month will be uh, politics, sex, and religion. Okay, Susan, you're next. Oh, you're still on mute, Susan. Thank you, Gerard. I really admire what you've done putting this organization together. I would like to speak briefly. Uh, I'm head of the uh, working group for GBA for voting. And I've been trying to drive that organization into building standards uh, around blockchain voting, but, uh, but concentrating on how the voting is going to be implemented, uh, going back to what Philip does with the smartphone voting. And then uh, we think that it's very important to have good standards and we invite everyone in the meeting to come help us build those standards so that as it's inevitable that the cell phone voting will roll out, there's no question about it. Uh, the, I'm, a, I'm a senior in, industry analyst. I know how markets grow. And the smartphone is used for everything. There's 9 billion smartphones out there in the world. This is a lot. And people are gonna start wanting, even in Africa, there is no way uh, to, to have a PC, but, but people have a smartphone and they use it for their bank, they use it for everything. And it's true here in the US, it's true all over the world. People use their smartphones for everything. So they will want to use it for voting. And we think, and we have worked very carefully, Philip, Gerard, and myself, most of the people here, trying to draft a set of standards that will protect the process, make the process, make the process better and more secure. And that's all we can do. We can build standards. We hope that this will be useful to people. Thank you, Susan. Um, and by the way, uh, uh, getting back to your, your request, I did. Ha I do have a recording of the last meeting and I'll send that to you and all the members of the group uh, shortly. Oh, great. Yeah, people wanted that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. there's a lot of great content. So for those of you who are not part of the voting working group, they do meet regularly and uh, uh, the, the conversations they have, it's really enlightening. Uh, Jeremy, you want to make some opening statements? So let me let me uh, start by uh, thanking Susan for her comments and and disagreeing on a key point. Um, I I think that there's a lot of space for standards, um, but I don't particularly see uh, a standard for blockchain voting any more than I see a use for a standard for a perpetual motion machine. Um, they're both lovely ideas, but secure voting and blockchain don't go together any more than perpetual, perpetual motions. I believe that our phones um, and other mobile devices can be useful in many ways, um, including banking, but online voting is just not the same as online banking as much as some people want it to be. Um, and it's, uh, you know, we, uh, it's important to have these conversations because there's clearly a lot of folks out there who are making statements about, well, if I can bank online, why can't I vote online? And there are lots of good reasons we don't. The, the risks are different. The defense, the level of defenses, banks spend billions of dollars on security, and yet they are routinely um, hacked successfully. Um, we don't spend billions of dollars on securing our elections, and so the odds of defending them are very poor. We have a long history of problems with blockchain um, technologies. Um, so there's, there's lots of good reasons not to do online voting, and the only good reason to do blockchain voting is because people want to, because they think it's a good idea, but there's no scientific reason to do it. Um, it's, it's a bad idea scientifically, and you'll hear that from me a lot today. Thanks. All right. Eugene. Yes. Uh, thank you again, Gerard. Um, I, I will do a very brief introduction. 
as I mentioned, uh, Freeton, which I represent, is uh, self-regulated and um, um, uh, distributed decentralized community. We have um, close to 150,000 members today, of which many uh, prefer to remain anonymous and act as such. We allow for anonymity. And what we do today is essentially a large scale social experiment. Probably that's the best way to describe it. Where people got together uh, voluntarily and started self-organizing. And they self-organized to such an extent that we introduced a system of voting, which is called SMV, soft majority voting, which is used every day on Freeton for all kinds of activities. The way it works in very basic terms is this. Anybody can come, come to the forum, which is open, accessible to anyone, and come up with a proposal. Hey guys, let's do this. And this can be anything, creation of new subgovernance, creation of contest to um, uh, submit and get rewarded for the best work and many, many other things. The way Freeton works is based on what we call meritocracy. All of the tokens that are being distributed to participants are distributed purely based on people's contribution. So somebody comes in, brings something, if the community values that contribution, that person gets rewarded and rewarded very significantly. The network was started a year ago. In fact, Gerard will be celebrating on May 7, and everyone is welcome to join us for celebration, one year anniversary of the network. In, in that short period of time, one year, not only we got 250,000 members, but also we have um, created a value which today on, the, on the cryptocurrency markets is valued close to 300 million US dollars. So from zero to 300 million dollars and 150,000 members in a year. Now, we uh, work with a lot of interesting things, which I don't believe anyone has done before during this complete anonymity, self-governance, and decentralization. I don't know if anyone in the history of mankind has actually tried to do that. So we are trying. And we're learning a lot of interesting stuff directly relevant to real life situations such as voting and elections. And we're very much hoping that our experience and problems as we discover them and address them and resolve them will be useful for more general discussion as it relates to US uh, elections, for example, but not just for US. As some of you know, we're actively working in numerous other countries, particularly in Guatemala, we, which we love as the sort of uh, test ground, <laughs> testing battleground, I should say, where we are trying to introduce and change one of the components of their current election process uh, happens to be the auditing of results. Um, so-called Forma 4, which is used in local polls, is subject to numerous um, illegal changes in the country. And so our effort there is aimed using volunteers to prevent that from happening. So we are most happy to share our experience with this group, and we are hoping that our knowledge and learnings will be useful for everyone. Gerard, that's my brief introduction. Happy to answer any questions further. Thank you. Oh, oh don't worry. We will have many questions, I promise. John, the floor is yours. Get my camera back on here. OK, so Gerard, um, clarify for me uh, what, what uh, amount of time should we use here? Because I've got a problem working in elections for over a decade. I can talk about it forever. Uh, well, the good news is we've got a smaller group of people, so I don't have as tight a, a, time, a, a time slot. If you have an open presentation, I want to ask you, keep it to around around 10 minutes, uh, Max, and, and then, um, and then we can, we'll, we'll have okay. lots of questions Great. back and forth. So um, I want to uh, try to get um, listeners and, and speakers to um, imagine uh, a kind of voting at home. Um, I'll try to describe that to you, describe what we're doing uh, at OSET. 
Um, and by way of doing so, I want to explain that if somebody uh, invented a way to do blockchain voting, it wouldn't be blockchain and it wouldn't be voting. Um, so that's that, that's the short tagline that I've got, but we'll, but we'll get there in just a few minutes. Um, so uh, as I mentioned at the outset, we're focusing on voters with disabilities uh, who are severely underserved. We started doing this um, during uh, the 2020 election because of the COVID pandemic, kind of to state the obvious, uh, a large portion of the 10th uh, to a third of American voters, depending on who you uh, talk to, who have some disability, um, many of them uh, participate um, privately and independently as required by federal law by voting in person and using a voting machine. And for kind of obvious reasons during 2020, a lot of those voters didn't really feel like going to a voting place. Um, but if they're the kind of voter that can't use a pen and depends on automated assistment, assistance to complete a ballot, um, they're not very well served by a state that says, for example, well, we're sending an absentee ballot to everybody uh, that's registered to vote because that doesn't work for those voters. Um, there are some solutions around that are used in some states, but not all states, um, called remote access vote by mail. So you might imagine somebody uh, sitting at a home computer or a tablet, maybe even a phone, uh, using some software that presents a ballot to them. So first they have to say who they are uh, to make sure that they're a registered voter. Uh, and so that this, the back end system knows uh, which ballot to give them, because as, as I, I hope many uh, on this call know, which individual ballot you vote depends on where you live uh, and how you're registered. So, uh, so that's an important step. Then the ballot gets presented to, to, the, to the person on screens, they indicate their choices, uh, and the system prepares uh, a ballot for them, as well as a voter statement. And that voter statement document and that ballot document uh, get printed by the user and then mailed back. So that sounds like it's at parity with um, uh, voting at home with a pen the same way that a voting machine is kind of parity with uh, parity, not parody, uh, parity with um, voting with a pen in, uh, in a voting place. Okay, uh, there's only one problem. Uh, the federal law requires that uh, such equivalent voting experiences be private and independent. And although it looks very independent, uh, for a voter with a disability to, you know, print out a ballot at home and put it in an envelope and mail it back. They're actually depending significantly on people that they don't know because that piece of paper that they called a ballot is a fake ballot. Um, it's just a regular sheet of paper that says what they chose. Uh, and those words on the paper are not what's used to count it. Uh, it's usually a barcode uh, that's used and sometimes the barcode isn't even used. It's those ballots have to be transcribed by hand. Um, so whether it's transcribed by hand or with a barcode reader, that at-home voter doesn't know, but they're depending on people at a county office to copy their ballot, which might include some errors. And that is a risk of potential harm that disabled voters are subject to that other voters are not subject to. And it does not matter how likely it is, and it does not matter uh, how often it happens or if it never happens, being subjected to that risk is not equal, it's not private and independent voting as required by federal law. So that's what we're trying to fix. So now imagine that the ballot that's produced for them actually is a completely legal ballot, full layout that's defined by state law, happens to be organized for eight and a half by 11 paper. Um, so that can be printed at home uh, and mailed back. So that really provides a fourth uh, option. And that's only one of three kind of different approaches to creating a legal paper ballot at home that, uh, that we're working on. We have requirements from states to do it in some different variations. That's the one of them that I think that's easiest to describe in words. Um, so if you voted that way on a computer, you actually have a digital ballot at one point. Um, you never had a piece of paper. You indicated your voices, your choices purely digi digitally. You recorded your identity and your voter statement digitally. You've got a digital ballot. Now, the system that we're building, it offers the user to print that uh, because that's the way that it's um, legal for them to get their ballot back for any voter, for any voter. It's a few voters in a few states for which digital voting is allowed. But imagine this. You just marked a ballot, you just voted, okay? You've just voted, there was no blockchain involved, all right? Now, 
of the many ways that you could get that ballot back physically, you could also, in some states, mail it back digitally, like by email or uploading it to a web server or, or stuff like that. But here's something that doesn't work anywhere in the country, which is to take your digital ballot and your digital voter statement, post it on a blockchain, like the one used for Bitcoin. That doesn't work because it's not a legal method of transmitting your ballot to your election official. Your election official doesn't look, doesn't look there for it, even if you told them that it was there, they wouldn't get it from there. It's equivalent to putting your, your, your paper ballot in an envelope um, addressed to Santa Claus at the North Pole. The USPS will take it away from your house, certainly, but it will never get to your election official or to the North Pole. Um, so when people talk about blockchain voting, uh, what they really mean is some for form of digital ballot return that involves a blockchain. But as, as I just said, a cryptocurrency blockchain uh, like Bitcoin is completely inappropriate. For one thing, it's not controlled by election officials uh, and the different computers that operate a uh, blockchain can reject things that people want to put to put on a blockchain. So that's really not an appropriate method. Uh, last time, um, for those who previously attended, I put up a little table that showed all the different types of digital ledgers, one of which uh, is a cryptocurrency blockchain, um, but other kinds of digital ledgers that are more suitable for recording election data. Um, so I might have the opportunity, but I won't do that now, looking at the time, uh, to say more about how that kind of different digital ledger, not for cryptocurrency, not really a blockchain per se, uh, might be useful um, in election data management. But right now, today, the type of things that people call blockchains, which are used for cryptocurrency, are not a good place to put a digital ballot, even if you live in a state uh, and have the special cases, like being a military voter, um, that um, permit you to return a ballot digitally, that would be a lousy way to do it because the election official isn't looking there. So um, although we're, we're really focused on the um, at-home voting solution that's truly private and independent for disabled voters, is although we're focusing on that, um, other people could focus on better methods of digital ballot return than say email, which is lousy, uh, and it might involve digital, digital ledger technology, but it wouldn't be a blockchain like Bitcoin. Uh, that is a really important misconception that I think really clouds a lot of these discussions. And that's what I wanted to try to maybe clear up uh, a little bit. Uh, but the problem there is, again, I'm going to draw a parallel before I close. I said that there was a risk of potential harm that disabled voters have with current uh, home voting solutions, which is that they depend on people who they don't know who they are in a process that's not visible to them. They depend on those voters to copy their fake ballot to a real ballot that can be scanned along with all the other ballots. Um, it's a different harm. We don't have to, when we're considering disabled voters and their federal voting rights, we don't have to assess how likely it is or how often it occurs. If it's a potential harm that they're subject to, their voting experience is not, it's really separate. It's not even separate and equal, it's separate and unequal, it's separate and different. And by parallel, um, if you had a disabled voter who chose instead of putting it in an envelope uh, and mailing it back to use some kind of digital return mechanism, it would be using the internet and it would be subject to all sorts of threats and harms that a paper envelope uh, and a Dropbox or a postman uh, just not present. So for disabled voters, some form of digital ballot return is really, really hard to imagine because it has security risks um, that are just different. So from a policy perspective, and this is a point that I wanted to close with, from a policy perspective, you have to somehow square the circle that says, we haven't fixed all the internet voting security problems, so we don't know how to get a digital ballot over the internet to an elections office in a way that's as safe as physically dropping it off, and yet people want to do that. So how do, you, how do, how do we do that? And I don't have an answer to that question. If I did, I wouldn't be talking here today. Um, I, you know, I'd be going and making a system that really did it, but we don't. So that's the, the sort of the limits of technology and policy that I wanted to um, put out here today in the context of the software development that we're doing that we do know how to do. Uh, and what we don't know how to do is do it equivalently safely on a ledger. Um, that's the limits of our knowledge. And I think Jeremy probably agrees with me from a scientific perspective. I was, I'm speaking from an engineering perspective and a cybersecurity perspective. Others may address that from other perspectives. So I think, Gerard, that's probably, probably where I need to open. Um, and uh, as I said, if anybody's interested in this disabled voting stuff, we can talk more about it. I'll answer questions. But mostly I just want to take this position that I staked out and use it as a place to comment on uh, some of the other things that come up in this call. Good enough, Gerard? That's awesome. 
Uh, okay, Phil, let, let, let me do this. Let me have everybody make their opening statements. We got we got a number of questions that are already lining up. Uh, John, we got a couple of questions for you, which I'm going to circle back to. Uh, let's see. We had Philip, Susan. Um, did we get everybody to do their opening statement? Eugene, did you do your opening statement? I certainly did. Okay, good. So that was uh, John was the last. All right. Well, John, let me let me ask you these two questions. Um, the first one uh, was that you mentioned you said something like. Uh, uh, the votes couldn't be done with a, a blockchain like Bitcoin, but there's lots and lots of other blockchains, permissioned and private, and all sorts of uh, different variations of, of blockchain, uh, uh, different architectures. Why? Why do you think that? Uh, why do you think that Bitcoin, the Bitcoin type blockchain, uh, be, because it can't, because it can't essentially work on that one? And I, I to tell you the truth, I kind of agree. Um, Although I I can't I could imagine ways that, that even that can work, but sure. um, but what about alternative? There, there's lots of alternative types of blockchains, and you know why couldn't a county uh, or a municipality or 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 even a state uh, have their own private? Like for example, we're talking to a couple states about building out a state level blockchain where either residents or uh, county agencies or offices would essentially host different nodes on it mm -hmm. to make it decentralized, difficult to to change. Um, so that was the first question. And then the other question is, how do you deal with the folks that really can't deal with the mail system, right? You've got, you got military and overseas and expats in, in very hard to reach places where, quite frankly, the mail system is not, not going to work for them. Well, let me answer, Jared, let me answer the second question first because it's more brief. Um, how do I deal with that? I don't. Election officials do. Uh, as an election technologist, um, our job is to create election technology that doesn't currently exist, that fills really significant gaps. Um, and we choose the work to do, partly it's a work to um, our uh, backers, philanthropists and donors, um, and also partly on impact. So um, military overseas voters, uh, a lot of people focus on that. Um, and that's not a really high impact place for, for OSET to be working. Um, as I said in my earlier remarks, we got focused in, in the last year on, you know, something like, I don't know, uh, 10, 15 percent of the electorate, maybe, um, that was being severely ill served uh, by home voting solutions that lied about meeting federal requirements. That really <laughs> got me going. And we had several states coming to us for home voting solutions specifically for disabled people. So we're really focusing on uh, this, the the larger portion of the electorate that are voters with disabilities who are ill-served by current options. So uh, other folks uh, can be working on military and overseas voters and have been for years. So um, also a footnote to that, many military and overseas voters um, can be well served by digital ballot distribution systems that are very similar to what I just described or home voting systems very similar to what I just described. We came out with the first uh, open source digital ballot distribution system for military and overseas voters over a decade ago uh, to uh, get them a ballot over the internet that they could print at home, mark by hand and mail back. Uh, so Gerard, the um, situation you're talking about is the subset of the subset of military and overseas voters for uh, at a election minus 90 or in some, just isn't enough time for them to download, print, mark and mail back. So that's a subset of a subset. And as I said, people are, other people are working on that, we're not. Um, now to your first question um, about what would a different type of digital ledger be that's not a cryptocurrency blockchain and what might a state government choose to set up? Okay, it's a good question. Has um, a, a lot of things uh, that are relevant that maybe don't even have anything to do with elections per se. Um, you know, so for example, uh, there's a lot of e-government stuff, uh, places that you can do transactions uh, with a government organization as a, as a citizen or as a taxpayer. Um, so a digital ledger would be a great way to record uh, transactions between um, citizens and uh, a government organization. Uh, so here's three ways, maybe four, that it would differ from a cryptocurrency blockchain. So first of all, being decentralized is not a value, okay, uh, in this context. Uh, governments centralize the processing of transactions with their voters. You don't have 15 different internal revenue services to deal with, you got one. Uh, you know, you don't have 
multiple different elections bodies to deal with. It's your one county election official who's legally required to centrally manage elections. So the value of a digital ledger is not in decentralization. It's not in disintermediation. It's in durability. It's a way to uh, publicly record some important information, a transaction between the citizen and the government in a way that's durable, uh, that's authenticatable, and those uh, properties derived from the cryptography uh, under the digital ledger uh, technology, and they derive from the distributed database part that goes with it. So that's so that's so that's that would be a reason to do it. So it it would be um, under central control, but have multiple nodes for the redundancy and integrity and security. It probably wouldn't be consensus based either, like a cryptocurrency blockchain. When you post something to a cryptocurrency blockchain, depending on what the nodes think. It can be rejected. Uh, that's wholly inappropriate. If we're recording a transaction from a citizen to a government, when it's posted, it should stay there, period. Uh, and the nodes should ensure uh, consistency. Um, there, so then, then, of course, there's the, the issue of openness or closeness. Since it's really not for decentralization, it's for control and distribution. Um, you wouldn't expect the state government to set up a digital ledger system and say any computer anywhere in the world can be, become a node in this ledger. No, it would be it would be a closed uh, system under under centralized control, but it would be a way to post information about transactions to, to the public, which would be great. And the one that is the most uh, pressing uh, for us, and this is a technology area we're working in, working in, is um, a private digital ledger that's centralized for recording voter registration transactions. And that's not something where members of the public would see it. That would be for state and county election officials to see so that there is a distributed, durable, uh, immutable record of every voter registration transaction, which they really need because today they throw away the transaction records, they update the voter database, and then if the voter database fails or gets hacked or whatever, uh, that transaction might be lost and a voter might be disenfranchised. Database uh, John, 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 let me let me um, let me let some other folks jump in here. Um, uh, I, I do. I, I, I really appreciate you being here because you, you raise a lot of uh, good points. We disagree on many, many points. Uh, I, w I will say this. I want to turn it over to, to Philip because I think he's got uh, some comments to make. But um, in terms of centralization versus decentralization, I just want to say one thing before I turn it over to Philip. We, when, when, I, when I, somebody has to make a decision on life and death or spending years in prison or, you know, things that are really, really serious, we we go to a judge and, and the decision is made by a jury, right? When we pass laws, it's done by Congress, right? It's not, it's not sort of a unitarian uh, or, or uh, it's, not a, it's not sort of a, uh, it's not a king. It, so I think that there's a lot of places in government where, where we distribute or decentralize the decision-making. Um, so that, that's just sort of a thought or comment. Lot, lots of other stuff I'd like to respond on, but I, I'm not on the panel. Philip, would you like to make a comment? And then Eugene, you can go next. Yeah, I'm going to say a couple things. First, John used the word we, and I would suggest that there are groups of we's. And we at Votes and some of our competitors are actively supporting both the disabled and the military and overseas civilians that are protected through the UACAVA Act. Uh, with the ability to return the, the ballot to the jurisdiction electronically. And they are an underserved community and they deserve the same rights as every other citizen in the United States. So when I think about what votes did, we started out with what was possible under the UACAVA Act of the US Congress and permitted in certain states. And then we expanded the ability to other groups as the states opened up the rights of the disabled to use electronic mechanisms to open up. That said, there is a need in most every state, if not every state, to adjust the laws and the regulations to allow us to do what John described in terms of serving the disabled community who are unable to have the privacy that they deserve and have the right to, and the military community outside of this country who struggle in certain communities to get their mail back. 
Uh, we, we need to deal with the law and we need to deal with changes to the regulations to allow these forms of technology to be embraced. I agree with John that using a open Bitcoin style ledger for what we're trying to do in the election space is inappropriate. There are things like secrecy, there are things like controls, there are parties who want to have the ability to manage the process. So yes, the communities responsible for managing our elections need to be intimately involved in deciding how we implement. And if they want to implement a record-based system, a distributed ledger, as part of their implementation, we believe they should have the right to do that and we enable them to pursue those rights in supporting. Unfortunately, Amelia is not here today. And one of the things that Amelia would be reminding us is that part of what we're here to talk about is how do we serve those people responsible for managing the election process who have an obligation to make sure that every citizen in the domain that they are responsible for have the ability to securely submit their decisions, their intent to be included in the count. And we need to make sure that we think about them as part of the design process because ultimately they have the legal responsibility to manage our election processes and if they want something, they will work with their legislatures to get the necessary changes done as it, we've seen happen in West Virginia, as we've seen happen in Utah. And if you think back to the whole vote by mail situation, there are five states that for quite some number of years have supported 100% vote by mail. So they've gone through the process. Several of those states are now looking at other forms there's actually an RFP in California that in came out very recently that is looking for a mechanism to support the disabled with the electronic return. So there's some of that particular conversation is we need to involve in the long-term conversation, the, uh, the government and the, both the legislative side of the government as well as the executive side, the executive side in terms of the management of the process and the legislative side in terms of defining the rules that govern how an election is to be run. But the, going back to the we, we at Votes have implemented using blockchain, a permission blockchain, mechanisms that allow the secure return of a ballot from, from any location where somebody has a secure mobile device. We respect those that are in op oppose that particular approach. And we, as we mentioned on the la last call, invite them to come in and talk to us to evaluate our software. We would prefer that they do that in coordination as opposed to as a hacker from the outside. Uh, and we're more than happy to have those dialogues. Th thanks, Philip. Listen, there, there's a, a lot of folks that want to um, make comments. I know Eugene does. I know Susan and, uh, and uh, Jeremy does. So Eugene, why don't you go ahead and make your comment? And then after that, uh, uh, Susan and then John. I'm sorry, John and then Susan. And thank you, Gerard. Uh, I do have only a few minutes left. I have a free town academy call in about seven minutes. I have to jump to that one. Yeah. But and, and, what... and do me a favor, give them my apologies that I won't be able to join. No, no problem. So, uh, but I wanted to come back to some of the comments that John made. Uh, they're very, very important. And I just wanted to let everybody know that we actually working with John and some other folks in the group to address the sort of the first stage questions that we have identified previously. So we are definitely part of that and are contributing the best we can. However, uh, thinking ahead, uh, we started another conversation, including with John, we're asking him some questions that would allow us to design and propose for your review a voting system, which is, John, based on decentralized mechanism, even though you voiced an opinion that it may not be uh, uh, acceptable, but we would like to try. And what 
I promise this group right now is that once we have some answers, uh, John, uh, that are in your email, and those really focus around the existing process of prior verification of voter or registration of initial registration of voter, if you wish. Once we have those, that what I promise is we will design the system which will be no worse than the existing one, acceptable, no worse, but it will be 100% based on blockchain and identity card, similar to your driver's license, if you wish, which I believe majority of Americans have. So we are very much interested in furthering this concept. We are happy to work with everyone. And specifically, as I said, we are now designing a system for your review. We will propose it and then ask everyone's comments, which hopefully, and that's my intention, will address all of the issues that Jeremy raised first and foremost, because his comments are very important. We want to address them specifically. And also John's comments here in this conversation as well, which are equally important. So just a heads up, this is work in progress. Stand by. Thank you. Thank you, Eugene. Uh, John, you, you had uh, some comments you wanted to make, and then after, after that, Susan. Fumbling with the buttons here. Uh, do, do, do. Yeah, um, I fielded a uh, question uh, that I just think it's worth sharing the, the answer to about um, digital ledger technology for um, voter registration records and transactions. Um, and the, the question there was about what, what type of ledger. Um, so I'll, I'll try to be brief about that. Uh, one, one approach is to deal with the uh, really significant data integrity and cybersecurity vulnerabilities of, of regular databases that are used for voter records. And to supplement that with a digital ledger that immutably records every transaction so that if the database is corrupted or compromised, uh, you can use your immutable ledger, the, your immutable transactions on the ledger to basically recompute your voter list. And that has to be uh, a distributed database for, for, for integrity, but centrally controlled uh, and permissioned. Uh, and it has to be private because the information on it is not, is not public, just you know, full, full voter records are not public information. So that's really just an internal to elections administration, uh, internal uh, use of ledger technology, a complementary approach might be a public ledger that is only written by elections officials, but is readable by everybody to also record those transactions, but minus the personal identifying information that's required to be part of, of, uh, of voter records. So to follow the databases. And as a matter of fact, um, that's really, you know, at the 30,000 foot view, that's the entire 30,000 foot view. There isn't a 15,000 foot view. And if you want to get down to a thousand feet, um, there's a lot of details and I'm happy to go into that. All right, let me, uh, um, Susan, I, I told you you were next, but Jeremy, I actually skipped Jeremy. So Jeremy, go ahead and make your comments and then Susan. Thanks. Um, so I, I find it really interesting, um, some of the comments, uh, and it's unfortunate that Eugene made his comments and then left, um, because he said uh, using driver's licenses, which uh, most Americans have, and he's right, most Americans do, um, but there's somewhere around five to 10% of Americans who don't have IDs. And so I find it fascinating that we're discussing technologies that disenfranchise five to 10% of Americans and they're disproportionately American, poor Americans and Americans of color. And I think it's important to recognize that technologies like this are, are um, pretty, there's some really negative societal aspects to doing anything that reinforces uh, the uh, uh, racial divide uh, in America. Um, moving on from that and moving going to what Philip said, uh, you know, I think it's great that Philip and, and, and his organization are trying to solve problems because we, we need uh, people to step up and try to solve problems. Um, however, there's a lot of subtext that's not written there. Um, there's there's uh, a promise to deliver something to the election office, but there's no way that any of us know, including the folks at votes, whether what's actually being delivered is what the voter wanted. And there's no guarantee that what was delivered was actually 
uh, what the voter selected because there may have been malware in the voter's phone. There may have been uh, software that observed and leaked the voter's choices. Um, I know the folks at vote say, oh, we have all sorts of stuff that, that prevents this. But the fact is bugs happen in software. Software gets manipulated. Um, and if we knew how to solve these problems, and then there are a lot of other bigger things like, like banking that where there's much more money at stake, that those would have been solved also. So, and votes is not unique in this, uh, but this has always been an issue in any of these technologies that assume we have a magic way to ensure that the voters selections are in fact the ones that get delivered to the election office. We do not know how to do that, period. Um, uh, no matter how much magic pixie dust anybody is offering, we don't know how to do that. Jeremy, I'm gonna interrupt. You use the word we. There are some of us who believe we do know how to do that. So if we're gonna use the word we and John the same way, it's not an inclusive everybody question. It is, and this is where- okay. the scientists, you interrupted me, I'll interrupt you. Scientists don't believe we have a way to do it. If you want to exclude yourself from the community of scientists and say, we believe we can do it by all means. And there are practitioners who believe, who have PhDs that it can be done. I would disagree, I, I, Jeremy, as well. There are a ton of scientists that support what Philip is saying. You cannot speak for all scientists. No. Yeah, I, I, let, let's do this. Uh, when let's do this. When we use the term "we" on this call, let's just say "we" it means our organization, right? Because clearly, the folks that vote votes. I think they can speak for "we" and and OSED and and different folks. But let, let's be let's be very careful not to speak for others. And I think that that is a general rule. Gerard, I'm going to object to the use of a term that is royal and has been well defined. If people want to speak of our organization believes that, then please say that. If okay, you that's fine. Believe I, that, then let's use a, a larger word. But we is a we is a, we is a confusing word if not fully appreciated by the listener. Philip, can I, you point me true. to any peer-reviewed publication by anybody? that shows a secure method of casting votes from a device that the organization doesn't control. Any peer reviewed proposal by anybody. As, as I mentioned on the last call, we are glad to have that conversation with you. I'm looking forward to your proposal. But that's not a peer-reviewed uh, description. I'm asking you a question. Is there any peer-reviewed publication by anybody that says, this is how we will build something so that nobody can manipulate it? There has been, I will state with a high degree of confidence that there is no peer-reviewed proposal or description to do that. I would agree with you that there is no outside review discussion of our proprietary implementation, because if we expose the implementation, we lose our, our property, our intellectual property. We are more than happy to have a peer review where the, the conditions of that review are to protect the integrity of the shareholders' assets. Right. Let, 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 oh, Jerry, right. hold on a second. Let, let Susan have, have a chance. Marita, I will give, I will open up the floor uh, in a few minutes to, to everyone because there's a lot of other folks that would like to, uh, to share thoughts and comments as well. So Marita, hang tight. Susan, yeah, the floor is yours. I'll be brief, brief, very brief. This is a nascent market, Jeremy. I have written about at least 200 markets that developed and became multi-billion dollar markets. And when they started, and when they were a $1 million market, a $500 million market, they were not as mature as they were when they became very, very, very large. So I think what our job here is to look at what the opportunity is, to look at what the challenges are, and to be constructive and think through what's the right direction here. And there are truly 
very, very highly qualified scientists working on the problem. What I want to say is that the government should be spending more money. If you look back over the years at the history of voting and the history of voting fraud, it's criminal how much money people spend on a campaign versus how much is spent on counting the votes. We really care about the outcome. We really care about a good result. But if you don't spend money on it, it's going to be haphazard. I couldn't it agree more, to, Susan. I couldn't agree more with you. It has to be something that people think are important and that they're willing to spend money on counting the votes. I've, I've thought this my entire life and I've seen it not happening. I couldn't right. agree uh, more, oh, Susan, oh. but, but spending money on doing something doesn't mean haphazardly rushing perpetual motion machines into use. It means spending time and money studying the problem. You see me trying to build some standards, Jeremy. We would love to have you in our group trying to build some good standards for this. Right. That is step right. one. And, and right, Jeremy, let, 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 me pause, let, let me pause you guys. On, I want to give... Let me, want, Jeremy's made a statement. P P Jeremy, what we have done is we have piloted our technologies. That is experimentation. That is a way to learn. If, if we you don't, do, if you do it in a controlled environment, not in a real election, we have been doing it in real election. We did it in the 2020 election. I know okay, guys, the wrong way guys, to do guys, it. guys, guys, let, let me pause you for a second. All right, so you're, some you're folks wanted telling us what's right and wrong, and I'm not sure you're the judge. All right, Marina, you, you've got a comment or a question. Uh, please go ahead. You can, uh, you can unmute yourself, Marina. She has. Um, Marina, I don't think we can hear you. So, uh, uh, so if you'd like, she's put a link in the um, uh, in the chat. So, uh, does anybody else have a specific question or comment for uh, the panel or any particular members of the panel? I'm going to comment on the link, Ger Gerard. That is old news. Okay. All right. Uh, would you like to speak to it, Philip? Yeah, she, she has provided a link to a piece of work that was done by a group of students at MIT. And they did their work. They looked at a version of our solution at a moment in time. They did not communicate with us. We were not engaged in that, quote, peer review, which a peer review is an open dialogue. They produced a document, and we have refuted that document on multiple occasions the system as then and the system as now is not the same. So that document is old news. Okay. And each Good. time it gets brought up, Maria, it's old news. All right. Good. Uh, anybody else, any other members of the audience have a question, thought, comment? So Marina is trying to raise her hand again. Uh, I think that's the same. Uh, that's the same raise as before. So I'll, I'll drop it. She can raise her hand again. I, I don't think her mic. Her mic is working. Right. Hear me now. Uh, Hello. Uh, can you hear me? We can hear you now. Okay. Good. So yes, it, it's 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 first of all, it's not the, that old of a news. It's less than a year. Take a look at the dates. Number two. You might not respect what I have to say, even though I've been in the blockchain since th Thursday in June of 2009, and I'm working on a digital identity solution. And I disagree with both parties. There is a way of doing it. Uh, maybe you're not technical enough, but there is a ZK snarks and zero knowledge proofs that can provide all of that in a secretive sort of speak environment where other people would not see it. However, um, votes is suing MIT in federal court. We are not. And that's not old news. It's still valid. Please, I did not interrupt you. Let me finish. I'm going to be done in two minutes. Philip, 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 let her make her, her comments and then, and then I'll give the floor to you. To, 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 just let her make her comments and then I'll, I'll give you an opportunity to, to respond. I've been looking into votes since the very beginning. In fact, it's a very first application that I was amazed about. From, and I know the founders and I spoke with them many, many times. Uh, if, when they presented at MIT at get against slurs and so forth and so on. But uh, both Mozilla Foundation and 
EFF, Electronic Frontier Foundation, that might mean nothing to people who are not technical, but certainly means a lot to people who are technical, filed amicus brief as the friends of the court in a federal court supporting MIT. And any blockchain product that is either not open source or um, does not want researchers who have nothing to gain to audit their chain and to find their vulnerability is not worth anything. All right, Marina, thank you. Uh, Phil, if you want to respond. Okay. I'm not sure that, I mean, first off, we are not suing MIT. There is no civil or criminal work on votes' part to sue anybody. So that's not true. Yes, we did file an amicus brief, as did EFF and others, in the context of the Van Buren matter in front of the Supreme Court. And there are multiple parties who have differing opinions as to how the CFAA should be interpreted. And we will leave it to the Supreme Court to render a decision at some point in the future. But we are not, we have, are not suing anybody. Yes, we did file an amicus brief. And yes, the Supreme Court is making a decision relative to CFAA, not relative to votes, not relative to the MIT report. Those are simply inputs to a criminal proceeding that was brought against the policeman in northern Georgia. All right. Uh, Phil, is that it? Yes. OK. Uh, Paul Dowdy, would you like to make a comment? Uh, yeah, so just quickly want to say, um, sort of to bridge the gap between the dispute of whether we use a blockchain or blockchain technologies. And, and I come from 30, 30 plus years in the financial services. There, there's no such thing as an incorruptible process. Uh, you know, any process, you, know, you can't protect yourself from collusion. However, the one good thing about what is the blockchain techniques is that it's a corrupt evidence process, meaning it can identify when something has been corrupted. So that's the point. And the idea of the decentralized uh, records is to ensure that there's a, a safety in numbers. And it's very hard for any individual or series of individuals to, cor to corrupt those transactions. And again, if they do, it's then corrupt evidence. The second thing I'll add is, last thing I'll add is that the other side of this distributed ledger is, and, and we're working on the technology to make it real time, is the fact that you've got a publicly available auditable record that can be validated. And again, if it's been tampered with, it's evident. So again, the, 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 the main thing in financial services to deal with corruption is to make it as hard as possible to do and as easy to spot. And, and the technology and concepts within blockchain and distributed ledgers, you know, support that approach very well. So I, I just wanted to make that point. Excellent. And now uh, ben, Ben's raised his hand. So Ben, I'm going to recognize you next. next. But before I do, Paul, uh, you guys have a really uh, elegant solution. Can you just kind of give folks just, just a really high level, I mean, I know you could go deep, but a really high level so they could understand, you know, there's different architectures for blockchain and different capabilities. And I think you guys really uh, are honest. You just want to share that real quick. Well, fundamentally, it's I, I see a lot of what's happening with blockchain is the application of technology, um, but there's a, is there actual a process challenge as well, and a control challenge as well. Like I mentioned, in terms of you know coming from the financial services, we're we're very concerned about control, and and what we found, and there's academic research that backs this up, um, is there is a mechanism to create consistency without the need of consensus or the competition of mining. So when you obviate those two processes, you, 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 you're operating in real time. And, and that's the real advantage uh, that we believe we have. Um, and, and we're working uh, to do that so that a network can self-synchronize and prove its consistency and completeness on an event-driven basis. Excellent. Yeah, it's, it's just really fascinating technology. Ben, do you have some comments you want to share? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, well uh, carry on from uh, what 
just being said then um yeah i very much agree that when it comes to these uh that these security issues i mean obviously I think that I accidentally uh, uh, muted Ben. Ben, you, you want to unmute yourself? I think that I, I was oh. lowering your hand, and I, yeah, and I. <laughs> I my, uh, no my, worries. It's my bad. No, no, not at all. Um, so yeah, I was just saying, obviously, uh, with regards to security, um, the, the sliding scale issue is the one that always comes back in these uh, topics, um, like was just being said. Um, but I did want to return to what John was saying. Um, he said a line which I found quite. Um, well, we'll say interesting. Um, you said uh, there's no value in decentralization itself, or decentralization has no value unto itself. Um, with obviously everything going on with uh, issues of trust uh, nowadays, um, especially with regards to voting and elections, um, could can you not see the value itself in the ability for the individual user in a hypothetical system, of course? Uh, to be able to run their own node or to be verifying things themselves manually. Oh, sure. Uh, ab absolutely. Um, when I said decent uh, no value to decentralization, what I mean is if we're in a government computing scenario where uh, the functional requirements of the system are that one party has centralized control, for example, maintaining voter records, um, it really doesn't make any sense for uh, other parties to uh, add a node uh, that could then change the records. Um, there are plenty of circumstances where a government transaction um, isn't necessarily required uh, to be managed by a central body. So that's really, it was, it was kind of a, a, a very election geeky statement, meaning just looking specifically at the responsibilities of election officials, they need central control. But <clears throat> when, I, when I said um, not decentralized, I didn't mean not distributed. Uh, there's an incredible amount of value to be had to having multiple nodes, each operated by a party that is uh, known to one another and which uh, has been approved by some central authority to be a node operator. There's a lot of value to that because, of course, the more nodes there are, the more proof we are uh, against insider fraud and collusion, uh, as, as Paul mentioned, and also proof against its corollary. So it's not just insider fraud or collusion of a person with privilege doing a bad thing. It, it would be tamper evident, that's great. But we also have the issue of uh, cyber adversaries obtaining the privileges of insiders and then abusing those privileges as an insider might if they were say a bad election official, uh, but instead say, uh, you know, their, their PC got some malware planted on it by a, an advanced persistent threat. So, so, those, so, so those are definitely values, but they're not, uh, they're not antithetical to distribution, and they're not antithetical to public visibility and the ability of the public uh, to replay transactions and understand what the current uh, state of the ledger is. Hope that helped. Happy to talk more ledger offline. Uh, after so, yeah, so, fantastic. Thank you, John. Um, I'd love to connect after this meeting as well, if you'd like to at some point, John. Sorry to uh, yeah. talk over you there, Gerald. No problem. And uh, Ben is an author. Uh, I'm sorry, a reporter. Uh, in the, ben, what's the publication? Uh, Hacker Noon. Are there other publications that you write for? Uh, Hacker Noon is my main platform at the moment. Um, I've got quite a good working relationship with the uh, editor over there. Okay. Yeah. So if you're interested in uh, in uh, contributing to a to a publication, Ben Ben would be the person to talk to. Um, listen, I want to give a Adam. Uh, Adam, an opportunity to, to say a couple of words. Adam, if you uh, if you'd like to share some words, I want to give you a chance. Uh, you, you're a member of the GBA working group, and uh, give your thoughts. Uh, sure, uh, a little unexpected, but but thanks, Gerard. Um, I am Adam Ernest. I'm the founder and CEO of Follow My Vote. Um, we originally um, started to pursue into in verifiable blockchain based voting when we came up with uh, some pretty innovative designs for such a system. And over the years on our path to bringing that system to fruition, we realized that the um, technology was really just not there in order to securely connect users to blockchain applications. So we have recently pivoted and have gotten grant funding to build a decentralized application development platform to support decentralized application development. And from there, we plan to 
dip our toe back into the, the, the voting arena and bring our designs uh, to life from that point forward. And I'm a member of the voting working group and helping to, to define standards at which these um, mobile applications will one day abide by. Thank you, thank you, Adam. Uh, so I have a question uh, for the for the panel, and that is, uh, I want to talk about uh, a secret the secret ballot, right? A and it, in in what way do you think blockchain either does or does not uh, uh, verify or validate the, uh, uh, the the use of a secret secret ballot? So uh, that open to anybody in the panel, Jeremy, you want, you want to start with that? Sure, I, I think it's, it's really an interesting question because secret ballots are, are really, really a challenge in, in many ways. And it's important to recognize if, when we talk about secret ballots, we don't mean just secret on election day or for the day after election day or for even a year after election day. We mean secret for all times. And this is a particular challenge and the way it, this gets dealt with in the paper world is uh, when you have paper ballots, by law, the ballots are kept for some amount of time. I think it's 22 months or something. I can't remember exactly. And then they're destroyed. They're shredded. But if the votes are recorded on any sort of a blockchain that is available to the public, and granted there are non-public blockchains, but if it's any sort of blockchain that's available to the public, then you have to be concerned with not only how to make sure that that um, vote stays secret today and tomorrow, but how do you make sure that ballot is still a secret 10 years from now when, when, and I emphasize the when, somebody finds a bug in the software that caused uh, bad run, random number generators to be used or um, uh, used uh, uh, quantum crypto to break the crypto or whatever. So you have to think long term, not just short term. And I think this is one of the real challenges to the secret ballot in anything that doesn't keep the ballots perpetually secret. Jeremy, okay. I, I, I Sue here, I, I, I again invite you to, in, to come to our standards organization. It seems to me that one of the standards and certainly something I've been thinking about quite seriously is that if you use a blockchain for voting, it should mimic the laws for paper ballots and it should wipe out those, wipe out that blockchain. That blockchain gets destroyed after the 22 months or whatever the legal requirements are. But, but if that blockchain is public, then someone could have made a copy of it. And the fact that you've destroyed that of the original doesn't make any difference, as you're well aware. This is the reason I say if the blockchain is any way, in any way available to the public. I think Philip. it should be dealt with by using standards. Well, okay, Philip. Okay, so, so Jeremy makes the, 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 the distinction between a public blockchain and a permission blockchain. And we absolutely respect the fact that we should be talking about a permissioned blockchain, number one. Number two, the question that, that Susan has raised in terms of we should be able to mimic the, the, the law. And if the law requires that the data be destroyed at a particular point in time, then we should absolutely make sure that in the design and the architecture of how the data is to be recorded, that there is a mechanism for deletion. Number three, the anonymous ID. I am not sure that the blockchain necessarily helps address the question of anonymity. Anonymity is about creating a, a unique value that can be associated uniquely to somebody without being able to reveal the identity, location, or any other characteristic that would allow me to derive who that person is. And yes, it is true, random number generators have been known to create mechanisms that allow me to get back to the root and due diligence must be included in defining, and I'm looking to Susan here in terms of standards, what is an acceptable set of algorithms to direct, generate an anonymous identifier. And so, you know, to your question, Gerard, does the blockchain help with the anonymity? I don't think so. 
in terms of the recording of the the ballot that's a different response yeah because my 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 thought is look when i when i mail in a ballot then uh m my name uh my name or my signature is going to be on that ballot so they can validate that this that the ballot came from somebody who's authorized to vote and then at a certain point they will separate the ballot from the envelope that it came in right and and why couldn't you do the same thing with a blockchain right couldn't the the vote be registered on a blockchain i don't believe that the blockchain can be destroyed because the one thing about blockchains is they're, they're supposed to be immutable right but hang tight for just one second hang tight for just one second no but but if the if the key of of the the voter's identity to a particular uh, record number record id right if that key can if, if that reference essentially can be broken just like you separate the ballot from the envelope right then you could do the exact same thing and mimic the way things are done now uh, with the blockchain gerard can i speak real quick on anonymity sure adam so so if you go to google patents and you, and you look up uh follow my vote in quotation marks you'll see our patent our once patent pending designs that we've released to the public and into the public domain. Um, we decided it was best for the world uh, to abandon the patent and let it be used by anyone who, who wants to leverage it. But it incorporates an anonymous voting key registration protocol that anonymizes the user um, prior to ballot delivery. So um, we think we've solved the anonymity problem and have a way to conduct end-to-end -end verifiable voting that is, that is uh, protects the user's right to privacy and allows them to remain anonymous in the system. Um, and I also wanted to add that um, we are taking an open source approach to developing not only our platform, but all of our software. And that's a stance as our company. So uh, I would encourage you to follow along on our journey. Excellent. Uh, ben, did you have a comment? Uh, yes, I, I just wanted to uh, quickly uh, point out uh, Freedom, we're doing some very interesting uh, things with uh, regards to implementation of uh, DGO or Governance 2.0. Here, um, it does, in, I'm sure one of the technical guys will be able to go into a lot more detail. So, this is only very surface level stuff. Um, but they're doing some really interesting work with commit and reveal phases for our voting processes on the contests and prof proposals there. Um, to my mind's eye, you know, some sort of reverse engineering of this process, like you were saying, uh, would, would be equivalent of the detachment um, of the name from the vote itself, hypothetically. So just a high level uh, thing we're doing at the moment. Excellent. Uh, Marina, did you have a comment? I have a little comment. Um, somebody asked me a question on a chat. I, I suggest they look at technology called ZK Snarks or Zero Knowledge Proofs. Uh, there was another comment I was going to make. Oh, I definitely do believe in um, blockchain voting. I think it's possible and probable. It's just we need a lot more technology to develop because right now we have no tools on the blockchain. We dig in ditches with fingernails. We need to create shovels. That's number one. Number two, the only thing that I know for sure that's going to be close to impossible to solve on a blockchain is if I want to vote, how can I, can, I, can anybody uh, prove any kind of technology that I don't have you standing next to me and I share my information with you and sell it to you? That's the only thing that I know that could not be solved on a blockchain. And I don't have any problem with selling it, but that's against the law in this country. Okay, good. Th thank you, Marina. John? John, say yeah. you're on mute. Uh, okay, not on mute after all, great. Um, yeah, so I wanted to, I wanted to return to the anonymity uh, question uh, for a minute uh, and the comments of uh, some of that have said how you can uh, create, you know, anonymous voter IDs and stuff like that. Um, th that actually kind of missed, I mean, I don't disagree technically with any of that, but it really misstates the requirement for the way absentee voting is structured in the United States. 
Now, I'm sure there's lots of other countries and lots of other voting laws and stuff like that. But the, the rule for absentee voting is that um, a ballot must be associated with a voter. Okay, that's the requirement. It can't be anonymous. An absentee ballot must be associated with a voter so that an election official and only an election official, it's their job and nobody else's, can decide whether that ballot is to, is to be counted, okay? So anonymizing a ballot uh, so that it can never be de-anonymized is useless for that meeting that requirement. It might have some other uses, okay? So, it, it, so absentee ballots have to be tied to a voter, but they have to be tied to a voter in such a way that the content of the ballot is not visible. And in paper absentee voting, you do that by sticking it in a privacy sleeve and everybody's on the honor system to not peek in the privacy sleeve until and unless uh, we get to the point where the privacy sleeve ballot and the voter affidavit are viewed together and the election official says, yeah, looking at this affidavit here, yeah, this person should vote. Let me separate these, take the ballot out of the sleeve where I'm not looking and drop it into a ballot box for later counting. That's the way absentee, votes, absentee ballots work on paper and digital absentee ballots need to work the same way. So blockchains and irreversible anonymous tokens and all that might do other things, but they don't meet that need. What does meet that need in a digital sense is a digital privacy sleeve, which is encrypting a digital ballot in a way that only an election official can decrypt it, which is actually, if you think about it, stronger than the honor system of a paper privacy sleeve. But the problem that Jeremy uh, identified is essential an encrypted uh, digital ballot that's tied to a uh, voter identity can't be made public because we can't guarantee it'll stay encrypted forever. You can't destroy it. Once you publish it, anybody can make a copy. It can be hanging around for ages. And if there's a bug in the crypto or whatever, uh, the forward secrecy is, is gone. So that's the, so the question that Gerard asked, you know, can't you do this in a digital way that's analogous to the, to the paper way? Yes, you can, but you can do it with encryption that isn't known to be perfect. And uh, blockchains don't help uh, with that. Uh, but the blockchain for the anonymous tokens and all that other stuff might provide other benefits. I'm just saying for what is actually required in American absentee voting, um, that's still a hard problem. But how does that, how does that compare for to other forms of, uh, of uh, voting. So for example, fax, mail, uh, you know, all, all the other forms, don't you still have the same problem? Oh, they're worse. And that's why when um, states have passed these laws, I guess 30 something states that entitle uh, military and overseas voters to return a ballot digitally uh, via email, fax, uh, and in some cases upload to a file server. Um, all those laws uh, in most of the states, not maybe not all, but most, require the voter to sign an affidavit that says, I am giving up my right to the privacy of my ballot. I recognize that election officials might look at my ballot and my identity at the same time. It's a lousy choice. Of course, it's a lousy yeah. choice. That's why so many people are working on so many better solutions, uh, Phil included, uh, solutions that might be, might be better than that. Um, Phil? And, but oh. any solution, any solution, that claims to be better has to meet that fundamental functional requirement of tying a ballot to a voter, but in a way where the ballot can't be seen. That's a fundamental requirement. Yeah. Got it. Philip? We, we believe we have successfully created a me mechanism to assure that the ballot credit is recognized by the jurisdiction and can be tied to the eligible voter list in a one-to-one -one comparison while simultaneously disconnecting the marked ballot that was submitted by that same person cannot be seen by anybody, including the election official who should not be able to see how I voted. They should simply know that my intent was properly received and counted not what my intent was. And we believe we have solved for that problem. There are those that would argue we have not, and we would be more than happy to have the discussion with those people under the appropriate 
conditions because one of the problems in, in a capitalistic society is there are investors and investors do expect returns. Uh, Chris, you had, some, uh, you had some interesting thoughts and comments. Do you want to share those uh, uh, verbally? Um, I've had a lot of thoughts and comments. Which one are you specifically <laughs> referring to? Well, uh, you you can you can take your pick. I've, I've been watching them as we, we go through, and, and I know sometimes when I'm on these things, I'm just sort of chomping to to uh, to, to weigh in. So feel free to, to share on uh, any topic that you like. Yeah. So um, I think probably the one that I'd like to address most is that concept of the digital privacy sleeve, the ability to separate at some point in time the record of the person and their intent and then the actual content of their ballot. And my thought was, if the concern is forward looking um, decryptability of information and the ability to uh, destroy essentially uh, that trail after whatever, the 22 months or whatever, would it be then prudent to think about the idea of, okay, well, let's just store the vote itself on a blockchain or some sort of ledger um, and have, again, an anonymized um, identifier for that vote. That anonymized identifier is then related to something more centralized, like a repository that the election officials do have at their disposal and only their disposal. And that connection point, um, which I referred to in my commentary as some interstitial database that connects the person uh, to the actual random identifier held with their vote, that could be what is destroyed later in the game. And so the actual votes and the audit trail of say the winner, um, just the general audit trail of the actual voting pattern is maintained indefinitely, but at some point in time, the destruction of this non-blockchain technology um, kind of register of the person is what gets destroyed and eventually does sever that information. So, so Philip, and since you articulated our name in your last comment, um, we, what you described in terms of what we record on the ballot is very well articulated. So I'm not gonna change anything you said. You said it exactly the way it's done. Where there is a difference is how we link the anonymous ID to the individual. The only person in our architecture who knows what the anonymous ID is is the individual, not the election official. Uh, because part of secrecy means that there's nobody who can see how I voted. And if you give the anonymous ID and link the anonymous ID to my name, then that election official could go see how I voted. And I don't want them to see how I voted because they're my next door neighbor. I actually, I, I like that. Obviously, I, I articulated it very similarly, but um, I'm also not a, a blockchain developer. I'm a product manager by trade. Um, and so what I'm really looking for is commentary by folks like John and uh, Mr. Epstein on what their thoughts are on technology like this from a technologist perspective and whether an idea like that does actually provide security. Uh, I'll, I'll be brief and then let Jeremy pile on. Um, there, there are a number of different uh, approaches to uh, an, an, an ugh, anonymization of transactions. There's a CS computer science literature is, is, is full of them. Um, so I, I think that in general, the approaches you're talking about have some promise, uh, mostly just what, uh, you know, I think anybody uh, in computer science or in, or in public technology would be looking for uh, is, you know, probably a published specification for, for peer review. Um, but I mean, it sounds like uh, the approaches that you're describing are, are, are potentially feasible. The devil's in the details, so that's where the peer review comes in. Jeremy? Looks like he's done. Ah, okay. All right. Uh, listen, I've got one other question, um, and then we, we, we may, we may uh, end up uh, uh, peeling out a little early, uh, but the other question that I have is, uh, with regard to blockchain and the use for voter registration. Clearly, when we look back on, on past elections, uh, voter registration is always a, 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 a challenge. Is there a place for blockchain in the voter registration process? Um, John, let me, let me uh, start with you. 
Uh, yes, ab absolutely. Um, if you, uh, I, I, I wish I could draw XKCD cartoons because I love XKCD so much, but there's a sort of an XKCD style illustration of before and after. Um, so if you imagine uh, a little, little person walking up with a piece of paper to somebody with a clipboard, okay? And they say, hey, here's my voter registration request. The person with the clipboard mm -hmm. takes that voter registration request, reads it, says yes, scribbles on their clipboard. Okay, now you're registered. Then they take the voter registration request and they throw it away. And what they, what they wrote the person's name on, on the clipboard is in pencil. And the person walks away and there's an eraser on the end of the pencil. We're not saying the, the clipboard person is evil and they use it. It's just that it's possible. And that's not really a good approach, right? So a better approach would be where this person walks up and says, hey, here's my voter registration request. Person looks at it, says, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, this looks good. I'll register you. They write their name in pencil on the clipboard. But then they take that, um, they take that voter registration request and they glue it to the wall with Harry Potter unstickable glue uh, so that it stays there forever. And then even if somebody later on comes, comes by with a big eraser and starts messing with the clipboard, you can go back to the wall uh, with all those voter registration forms and then recompute uh, your voter list. So that's a, a, a way of explaining by analogy that databases, which can be tampered with and, 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 um, and the data can be erased, is not a good way to keep a voter list. It's a great way to manage a current voter list and do all sorts of data manipulation, but is the primary immutable data store for all the transactions, not so good. And that's what a digital ledger would be great for. And in fact, we've been, did, did some prototyping on that in the last couple of years and you know, presented it at, to some government organizations and stuff. Um, that got somewhat lower priority because of the pandemic and the work that I've spoken about on this call. Uh, but the technical use for it is absolutely right. And uh, folks at uh, DHS and CISA and EAC and stuff uh, have you know, basically endorsed the concept. Uh, getting it implemented, that's gonna be some work. Gotcha. Um, Mark, uh, Mark put a comment in there. Mark, do you wanna ask your question? Can, can I answer, Ger Gerard, can I speak? Oh, sure, sure, sure. And you just asked. So what John described, we agree with. Um, the devil in the detail as it comes to voter registration is identity verification. And how are we going to perform identity verification? And back to Jer Jeremy's point that not all people have, have a government identity document, we've got to figure out how we're going to address identity in a digital age. And I think that is a larger problem. And given that we leave that to the states, it's a 54 entity problem, if I include the four territories in that number. And I know there's a lot of people working at different places within the government to ask the question, how do we get there? And I know, for example, ANVA, which is the American Association of Motor Vehicle Agencies, is looking at digital solutions. But again, it's to a limited population, those people that are willing to go to the DMV and get an identity card. So there is a bigger problem related to identity verification that needs to be solved. And yes, the blockchain is a great way of recording whatever it is we solve. Excellent. Anybody else on the panel want to hit that before I turn it over to Mark? All right, uh, uh, Mark Stewart, uh, you, you asked a really great question. I'd, you can ask it verbally if you like. And Gerard, thank you so much for inviting me to this. This is my uh, first time attending this, this um, symposium or this seminar. Um, so I'm learning a tremendous amount uh, already. And so one of the, so I'm the vice mayor of Chandler, Arizona, which is uh, one of the largest cities in Maricopa County besides Phoenix, Arizona. And, um, as, you know, so I would probably be uh, classified as your retail um, sort of browser of this blockchain technology, but we're already implementing some things within our city to uh, run an election through votes um, in parallel path with our current election with the recorder. But my question is, is, and I've been listening intently um, and I'm seeing you know, a lot of uh, what I'll call balloon poppers, uh, which is what I guess scientists do or people that are in this space are, are required to do is to look for vulnerabilities within this process. But 
I use the term, are we letting perfection get in the way of progress? And so what I see is when you go back and I was reading the MIT link that was dropped in and in the first page, it talks about Russian collusion or, or the Russian interference with our elections. So if we accept that to be the facts, right, that, that Russian did, which I don't, uh, not, not to the degree that it was uh, mediated w w within our um, uh, mainstream media, but if it was a fact that they were, and this is something that could solve that problem, then I don't know why there is a discussion on, on, um, on yes or no, but it should be when we implement a more immutable way to, um, to vote for our community. And then you add the accessibility to it earlier. And I'm a little offended when, when people talk about um, people of color not having access to be able to get IDs and things like that. It's, that's, that's systemic throughout anybody that is, is suffering poverty and has nothing to do necessarily, even though there may be more people that have challenges uh, that, that are people of color. But to say that people can't get IDs is, uh, I think is a misnomer and it's something we shouldn't be talking about. But that gentleman made, up, made a really good point. And I think we're talking about getting into this perfection of this system. Um, we can, everybody in the United States, and I'll just speak for, for the United States because I don't know who's on this call, has a phone. We have a program within our community, within our nation that provides everybody a phone. If we can give more people access through this technology to be able to vote and to do it anonymously, uh, um, I think we should continue these conversations moving forward. So my question is simply, are we letting perfection get in the way of progress as it relates to some of these uh, articles that are being written, et cetera? Love to hear some comments. We agree with you, Mark. Well, that's it. I'm going to go now. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, Mark, I had, I, uh, I'll give Susan. I'll give you a chance to, to, to speak in just a second, and, and John and anybody else if you want to. But, um, but Mark, I did want to sit, uh, ask you a question. Are you are you a GBA member? I'm not sure what that is. Um, oh, Marky, 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 Marky! How do you get out of bed in the morning? <laughs> <laughs> go to listen. Go to gbaglobal.org, right? Government Blockchain Association. Uh, go to the membership tab. GBA uh, government blockchain is free for all civil servants. It's free. Right? Yeah, it's to it's totally free. And 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 what we do is we we get the public and the private sector together to connect, communicate, collaborate, and solve problems. Um, so my my goal is to get every uh, public official in the world that cares about blockchain to be a member of our organization and uh, and to be able to connect with folks in the private sector uh, so they can talk about these sorts of things and. and find solutions so that that's that's uh that's the first thing um yeah and now that i think that that's the only thing that's important <laughs> okay uh any uh, uh anybody want to uh, john did you want to respond to it oh and I, wait i promised susan first sure sure, sure. Yeah, let me, i i promised um, susan first she raised her hand first uh, so yeah susan so um i i personally uh don't believe that uh we in the sense of uh election technologists uh, or computer scientists um, who know about elections. I, I don't think we're, we're preventing progress uh, based on uh, perfection. Um, I, I, I will give one example as a counterexample uh, of a position which might uh, sound like that. Um, and a position for that would be, um, you're a disabled voter, you have to vote at home, you can't handle a paper ballot even if and you can't get it to your elections office even if you live next door without depending on a person your right to your right to vote privately and, and independently can't be met by any existing mechanism so suck it up and we're never going to work on trying to get you a better way to do it that would be wrong a few people a few people seem to be taking that position but the progress that we're, that we're working towards uh, is in using computer science to solve the six hard problems that would be necessary, uh, the six hard problems in computer science, I should say, that would be necessary to build a system um, that was actually better uh, than today's paper-based uh, absentee voting in the sense that there wouldn't be a postman on the street who could steal your ballot. Um, so uh, I know that DARPA uh, has been funding work uh, on that front for some of the hardware security issues that, are, that, that must be solved in order to have trustworthy computing as part of internet voting. 
Uh, I know that uh, Jeremy at NSF is familiar with an enormous amount of uh, government research spending. Uh, so I, I, don't, I don't think that, in, that, that anybody is reaching for perfection, they're reaching for solutions. Uh, in terms of nation state adversaries, I would just say that if we adopt a new technology that could make the system more vulnerable to cyber, cyber adversaries anywhere on the planet, uh, the proverbial Russian hackers or Chinese hackers, then that might be a step backwards. The problem with assessing it is it's a technical issue and you have to depend on computer scientists and other technologic technologists to make an assessment. And that requires open technology. So that's a bit of a conundrum, I admit. But I, don't, I, I really don't want anybody to leave this call thinking that election technologists and, and computer scientists um, are reaching for perfection. We know that perfection is impossible, but we're certainly, certainly reaching for solutions. And thank you for that, John. We would encourage those computer scientists not to use words like settled science when they talk to politicians. Um, I, I do want to, uh, yes, Susan. So I, I, I want to say that what's really important here is that elections are not perfect. They're never perfect. What works and what has worked, what, there may be a change, but what we see is working is that fraud is detectable, that problems are detectable. Then you have a choice about what you do about it, but then things don't get washed over and made uh, and the election decided in a wrong way because something was not detectable. And I want to commend you for going forward and trying the system. If the system was really bad, trust me, you'd be running a, two systems at the same time. You'd be saying, okay, this is experimental. We're just going to run paper and we'll try the smartphones at the same time, but no one has felt it necessary to do that. Those cell phones are good. All right. Um, so, uh, panelists, it, it's uh, it's 11, 12, oh, it's, it's 12 51 where I am. No, it's 12 51 where you are. It's a totally different time where I am. But uh, uh, I'm, I'm going to be wrapping things up here. Right. Any final thoughts that any, any members of the panel would like to make? I think we covered a lot of ground. Uh, all right, I'd, I'd like to thank everybody. Yeah. Yeah, I was just, I was just gonna say, you know, I, I really appreciate everyone's time and, and discussion today. And I'm, I'm glad to hear that everyone is, is moving towards, you know, um, opening up to the idea of, of how this can be done. You know, technically I think, you know, anything is possible if we put our minds to it and work through it. And then not closed off to that this it, it, it can't work. So I, I commend you, Gerard, for, for keeping the conversation going. And and I would love to to continue to focus on you know how how can we get this done? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Uh, Chris, uh, do you have a party thought or question? Yeah, I wanted to um, leave on what Susan said, where she said the, the the problems that can infect an election are now more findable. They are uh, trackable. We're, we're catching this fraud. And I'm not going to comment on whether that's true or not, but what I do want to get to is the, the use of media, social media, all types of media, and how that can pervert the public opinion of whether that fraud can or has been caught. And I think one of the interesting things about the concept that I've been talking about today, where you do have that anonymized, decentralized, publicly viewable record of all votes is everyone can go in there and do their math at that point without knowing who made the vote, but they can tally it up themselves. And so by allowing that level of information to be transparent to the public, I think you do a great service in eroding this concept of, I have to trust that they made the right calculation because I'm not able to see the data myself. Um, and I think that's one thing that we're seeing right now is um, some an auditor goes in and says, we found no fraud. Or an auditor goes in and says, we found a bunch of fraud. And the public now has to go, which auditor do I trust? Whereas if the public can self-audit without getting rid of that anonymity problem, um, sorry, without having that anonymity um, 
be shown. Um, how, what do y'all think about that? How does that help? It would be great if we could figure out how to do it without any unintentional side effects. Yeah, and, and then there, there are things like you should not be able to count the vote before the vote is closed, uh, which then creates some interesting challenges that have to be addressed. And, and you know, if you're a small precinct with maybe 200 voters, you suddenly have an interesting conundrum of how do you assure the anonymity if you're a million person precinct, obviously it's easier. So it's, it's, it's not a simple problem to solve. So let me, let me ask the group, uh, we have about five minutes left. Um, do you guys want to keep the conversation going? Do you feel like there's still more things to talk about? We could schedule another, another one of these things in a month or two. Um, any thoughts about uh, whether uh, if we did schedule another one, is it something that you'd like to come to? Are there topics that you'd like to continue discussing? Yeah, I think we need more talk, Gerard. This is a good meeting. Okay. And, so I got one. And yeah. I want to be careful that we don't do what some people do, which is sit there and go back into the past and assail one company versus another. I mean, this has got to be an open and congenial conversation as soon as we get into finger pointing, we lose the objectivity that we're seeking. I, I would like to con condemn, I mean, not gonna commend everyone because I think that this meeting, um, you know, uh, a number of, of, of us of dissenting opinions are getting together and, uh, and having a conversation. And it's really, it's really been a great, a, a great process. Um, and so I, 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 I'm grateful for those of you that are willing to come and talk and, and share and argue. Uh, I think that's great. Marina, do you have a comment? Marina? Can right, you, uh, are you able to hear me? Now, now we can hear you, yes. So all I was trying to say is I'm not going to the past. Every link I posted is less than a year old it's still going on in the courts. I think we need to be aware of it. And I'm not representing any company that has any other voting application. So I'm not trying to put one company in against another. Uh, uh, I understand, Marie. And, and you've, you've raised some of these points on, on uh, uh, prior uh, calls and stuff like that. So um, I don't know what else to say. But, uh, uh, all right, so I, I'll go ahead and schedule another one of these in about a month, um, uh, same time. Uh, send invitations out to the, the same folks that appeared here. Uh, if you do like this, uh, www.gbaglobal.org. If you're not a member, we would ask you to become a member uh, and help support us. We are, uh, the one thing that I do want to share for those of you who are not familiar with, with us as an organization, we have over 50 working groups. Um, voting is just, a, uh, unless it's just one of them. We have 120 chapters with about 4,000 people around the world. Um, and so, uh, our goal is to create a fabric of people and technology across uh, boundaries, across uh, geographic boundaries and, and political ideological boundaries, and really bring folks together to find ways that we can use blockchain technology to solve public sector problems. And so if that's something you'd, you'd like to be a part of, if you're a member of GBA already, please join a working group, get in there, roll your, roll your sleeves up and get to work. We've got, we've got a lot of work to do, whether it's cryptocurrency and tokenomics, or whether it's voting, elections, healthcare, identity, supply chain, I mean, we'll kind of cover the whole gambit. And uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done and we could really help you. And Mark joined GBA, so we need to have a celebration. Awesome. Um, Mark, feel free to re reach out to me. Uh, if you go under the about section, uh, you'll see my name and contact information there. Uh, but we, we'd be happy to show you how to uh, get connected with all the different work groups and stuff. Um, there's this, this, uh, uh, meeting is has been recorded. It will be on our YouTube channel. Uh, to find the YouTube channel, if you go to gbaglobal.org under resources, go down to videos, and there's a wealth of, uh, of information there, including links to, uh, to, to previous meetings like this that we've done. And, um, uh, and then we have some major events coming up. If you just hit the events tab, uh, and you can see our big event that we'll have in Washington, Government Blockchain Week, uh, and that'll be in uh, 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 in September, late October. Linda just posted a response to the MIT report. Um, so 
good. Well, listen, you guys have a great uh, rest of your day. Again, thank you for, for uh, being here, and we look forward to seeing you at one of our next events.